Yes. So it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce uh, Dr. Daniela Dubrava to this uh, uh, round of seminars that we have in the uh, Center of uh, World Christianity here at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. Um, uh, Dr. Dumbrava is no stranger to uh, our uh, college because uh, she uh, was here in order to carry out research which uh, led her or which uh, helped her complete her uh, doctoral research into the, um, uh, the in, into the travels of uh, Nikolai Milescu, who is who was uh, producing maps for the Tsars essentially. So he was. Uh, it was a um, a Eurasian enterprise, and um, actually, um, what I never told you is that your inter your research actually uh, uh, more than history <laughs> reinforced. Yes, reinforced yeah. my interest in um, in uh, the populations of Eura of uh, Siberia, and th that's why I that was one of the reasons why I decided to study Manchu. So, and Manchu's uh, studies here are blossoming. So it's uh, very, yes, uh, very yes. that made me very happy. So uh, anyway, so, um, uh, and then uh, in the course of uh, uh, her studies, uh, she also covered the, um, the interrelation, you could say the interrelationship between the Orthodox church and the, the Western churches. So it's an East Western Orthodox um, uh, Orthodox Christian, um, a communication that you find in her work as well, which uh, I thought um, made her very uh, suited for this uh, circle that we have. Um, I uh, had been expecting before I um, reconnected with um, Dr. Dumbrava, I had been expecting uh, um, more uh, communications in the same direction, but actually uh, I was very pleasantly surprised when you when I found out that you were uh, studying um, the uh, very complex relationship of communities in Lebanon, which is of, of course today's topic. Um, Lebanon, I, I know very well myself, uh, I spent some time there, uh, the American University, but the, the, uh, um, the, the Western um, uh, part of the Middle East, the Levant, uh, has its own, very own tradition uh, where um, uh, harmony more than conflict actually characterizes the uh, overall picture but conflict of course does arise and often often as the consequence of uh, bad politics so that's um, uh, perhaps something that we'll be returning to later but i don't want to uh, say much more myself. I would like to invite you to uh, turn your attention to Dr. Dumbrava and her uh, uh, recent experiences, which uh, feed directly into her current research. So thank you very much, and please go ahead. And you should be able to share your PowerPoint uh, from your screen. Yes, I will try to do it. Uh, one second. Um, so, um, First of all, thank you for having me to the seminar. And um, I, I will start the PowerPoint. I hope to, <laughs> to manage to do many things in the very same uh, time. Um, uh, so first I have to share the, the screen, right? Uh, one second. Um, yes. Okay. Um, yes, it is already. Yes, we can uh, see it. Available. Okay, good. You can see it. Mm -hmm. So I, I will uh, because the actually um, the, my paper is rather long and the discussion. I think there uh, there will be many questions. I will prefer to to start, and uh, I'm pretty sure that people already uh, wrote the the long abstract that I uh, offered to uh, you and you divided to every, sent it to every person. Uh, person. And uh, so um, I, before I start in my lecture, since the subject is quite sensitive, I would like to state two things out the, uh, at the outset. Uh, one, this is a research in progress. Uh, not definitive, where the priority is to synthesize a fairly extensive volume of documents found from several archives, especially Beirut and Bucharest. 
Uh, these documents offer me the possibility of sketching out the history, um, mainly ec ecclesiastical and university teaching, that is very often seen from a political point of view. Obviously, it's more than more than ecclesiastical and <laughs> university teaching history, but uh, however. Uh, and second, my uh, exposition is based, on, based only on the documents before I can claim or say that I have outlined a general analytical framework uh, leading to conclusions. The only advantage I feel I have in analytically constructing this topic in the coming months will be my multi-faced academic preparation through or not that of trans, uh, transnational justice. Well, I mean, I'm only historian and uh, I will not make justice to anyone. Um, thanks to the detailed documentation that I had the opportunity to consult, uh, today I can speak of a laboratory of Islamic Christian education founded and developed in the same time frame as the civil war in Lebanon, more precisely in Beirut. Consequently, within the same framework, there are massacres, struggles between the various factions or either side of the green line, and finally, almost invisibly, a mutual uh, pacifying vision put in action by a group of professors at San Joseph University in Beirut. I think it is useful to briefly uh, specify the fact that the ethnic and religious configuration in Lebanon is really uh, different compared to the it to its territorial dimension is very rich actually. Uh, the dimension is <laughs> small, but <laughs> the richness of uh, religious and ethnic people is it's great. It is a country that <clears throat> now has about seven, um, seven million citizens, if I'm not wrong, of which more than a million are refugees only, uh, mainly Palestinians, Kurds, Syrians. These refugees arrived in Lebanese territory in several waves, but in any case, after 1950, these refugees are, um, whatever, um, whether it is the foundation of the state of Israel in the case of Palestinians, the flight from uh, Turkey, Kurds, in the case of the Kurds, or the recent, recent war in Syria in the case of Syrians throughout the last uh, century and at the beginning of the new millennium, they reside in various parts of Lebanon as well as in Beirut. Now, uh, according to United Nations High Commissioner for People, Statistics, um, uh, statistics. Seventy-five point six percent are Muslims. So Sunni, Shia, Alawite, Ismailis, uh, and thirty-two point four percent are Christians. Um, the wider group of Maronites, the Greek Orthodox, and other smaller groups. Uh, Latin Roman Catholics, Melkites Catholics, Armenian Orthodox, Syriac Orthodox, and Iraqi Christians, Assyrians, Chaldean Catholics, Copts, Protestants, Presbyterian, and Seventh day uh, Adventists. And finally, 4.62% uh, 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 are the Druze group, uh, concentrated in the rural areas in the mountain east of south of Beirut. Even their half monastery it is in actually in the true uh, part of the, of, of the mountains. The Jewish community is also almost non-existent in Lebanon, despite their presence in 1911, as they came from the Mediterranean uh, regions. Their community prospered during the French mandate, but civil war forced their relocation to Israel. I have seen the Jewish cemetery in Beirut, located not far from St. Joseph University, unfortunately in a sorry state. Magan Abraham Synagogue, although restored in, uh, after 2008, well, was again damaged after 2020 explosion. And uh, there are also groups that are not recognized by the Lebanese stat state, Baha'is, Buddhists, Hindus, the neo-Protestants, so on. Uh, the structure of current uh, Lebanese parliament, uh, uh, secondly, Taif Agreement 1989, should also specify this is banality, but I repeat it for someone who is not familiar with the history of Lebanon. 
there is to be an equal number of Christians and Muslims. Uh, the Speaker of the Parliament is a Shia a Muslim, the Prime Minister is a Sunni Muslim, and the President of the State in a Maron is a Maronite Christian. For now, I do not think it's necessary to go into the details of various factions of the civil war. Uh, but um, maybe I will enter in the subject at the right time and I will try to speak. However, they interrelate and permutate according to the ethno-religious diversity then uh, and now in, in the territory. That is all about. Um, so I, I will try to explain uh, who are the founders of the Institute of, of Islamic Christian Studies in Beirut. Who are the persons? And uh, I will start with um, Professor uh, Yusuf Ibish, which was born in 1926 and uh, passed away in 2003. Professor Ibish was in the last years of his life, the director of al Khan Islamic Heritage Foundation and is remembered as a figure strongly focused on the promotion of Islamic culture as he was also appreciated outside in the Islamic world. He was born in Damascus in 1926, as I said, and uh, had a Syrian Kurdish paternity. He did his undergraduate uh, degree uh, at the American University in Beirut, of Beirut, after which he continued with, the, with his PhD at Harvard with the Scottish historian orientalist Sir, Sir Hamilton Gibb. Uh, then James Richard Jewett, professor of Arabic at Harvard. Incidentally, the latter, the latter has uh, had his alma mater at the University of Edinburgh and School of Oriental and African Studies, London. Yusuf Bish went on um, to become a professor then in uh, American University in Beirut, of Beirut, where he taught from 1960 till 1984. During his time, he not only offered lecture uh, to the Institute, but also arranged for the student from the Institute to come to the American University in, uh, of, uh, of uh, Beirut. <coughs> uh, as access was difficult in East Beirut where San Joseph University and the Oriental Library was located. From 1985, he was invited as a lecturer at the American University in New Washington and um, was also a distinguished professor uh, in 1985 and 1989 at Cambridge University. He published many studies and books, and I will mention only two of them. The Political Doctrine of Al Bakani, Oriental Studies, American University of Beirut. And uh, together with Ilana Marculescu, Rodko Chapel, Houston, Texas, Texas, Contemplation and Action in World Religions, selected papers from the Rodko Chapel Colloquium on Traditional Modes of Contemplation and Action in 1978. He was uh, brilliant actually and i was amazed actually reading about him he i'm unfortunately i can uh, he passed away and um, there is only one professor that is still living uh, living in beirut from all these four and this is uh, professor hisham nashabe uh, born in 1931 in tripoli sunni muslim as well as uh, i said uh, yusuf Bish. He uh, was the Secretary General of the UNESCO Nation Commission for Lebanon, trustee of the Institute for Palestinian Studies. Since 2011, he was the chairperson of the Board of Trustees of Makassar University of Beirut, director of Makassar Higher Institute for, for Islamic Education. Uh, I had the opportunity to visit and meet uh, Hishad Nashabek in person in Beirut in uh, February 2020. He was very distinguished presence and uh, we talked for uh, over an hour. Although I had no serious documentation at that time, I understood that the close relationship between Skrima and uh, Dr. Nashabe was like that, not only because of their collaboration in the university classroom, but also because of the civil rights of the Palestinian population in the Middle East. They, their state um, stats of refugees. 
as far as I know, at this stage of my research, I was not, uh, it was not a matter of being part of the Palestinian political faction in the Lebanese territory, but rather a vocation to moderate the tone of the Muslim religious Sunni elite and to have his informal contribution to the peace process in the Middle East. The archival documents, uh, for example, the correspondence between uh, Father Augustin de Prelatur uh, and Father Scrima never reveal any political details or preference for any uh, groups fighting in a civil war of Palestinian origin. Professor Nashabeh uh, left me uh, with the impression of a person with an aristocratic and courteous nature always grateful for the relation uh, with uh, Father Scrima in this critical time. His position uh, of as a Secretary General of UNESCO National Commission of Lebanon remains a reformer uh, as a, a, the reformer and is still a historiographical point to be clarified for, for myself and for, uh, for other people. Then, um, um, I will speak shortly about uh, Augustin de Prelatour, uh, who was the director of the, the L'Institut d'Etudes Islamo Chrétien. Um, here we, we, you have uh, um, a photo from, a historical photo from, uh, from the aula, from the classroom. And uh, he, he is rather young here. He passed away in 2011 and was uh, born in uh, France, called Marhol Rin in, in uh, January 1921. He graduated in classical uh, literature from the University of Grenoble in 1942, and in philosophy for the Faculty of Philosophy Societate Ciesus in Valpre Le Puy, France. Uh, in 1946. He completed his master's degree in philosophy at the University of Lyon in 1950. Uh, and he then went to study for his PhD at the Gregorian University in Rome, which he completed in 1961. He speaks uh, several languages in addition to his mother tongue, namely Arabic, English, German, and Italian. And he has a perfect knowledge of ancient Greek and Latin. In uh, 1965, uh, 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 he became professor of dogmatic theology at Saint Joseph University in Beirut. He, has, he was head of the Department of Continuing Education in the Institut Superior, uh, at the Institut Superior de Sciences Religieuses and director of uh, Institut d'Etudes islamo chrétien uh, Father Augustine has published several studies on patrology and many volumes have been coordinated and edited by him. Augustin de Prelatour was also crucial in his vision regarding -Christian, Islamic Christian relations through his time in Beirut. Cardinal Jean-Louis Torrent, president, president of the Pontifical Council of Interreligious uh, Dialogue, remember him as one of the most influential people in Beirut University allied and uh, in opposi opposing fundamentalism of all, all kinds, both Christian and uh, Islamic. Considering his connection with Father Andres Krim, I believe he was most likely extremely close given his theological and philosophical training and background, as well as his ethical and otherness rigor with uh, different Christian denomination and the Islamic religions, religion. In fact, the two of them have achieved a great deal together. First of all, an original system of teaching which allowed people of different faiths to reflect themselves in um, each other with the greatest respect while keeping their religious identity intact. Secondly, they have always combated, uh, combated, um, combated a religious fanaticism of all kinds, putting in place a method of interreligious multidisciplinary study, study. And he was extremely close to Father Schema, actually. They were very good friends, actually. And um, the correspondence is still unpublished. I published just one article many years ago, and now I am going to publish a book 
when uh, where and I would put um, he, and I would publish publish part of this correspondence. That part which is which I retain is is very important. There are few letters which um, that are not uh, relevant for the research uh, and ma mainly with pecuniary <laughs> details, <laughs> salaries uh, and so on. So I, I don't want to publish it. But um, soon we will have a book. I mean, I hope so. <laughs> um, I will uh, try to speak a bit about Father Schema. He was born in uh, 1925 uh, and passed away in 2000. Orthodox monk at the time, member of spiritual father, uh, uh, at the time, member and spiritual father of St. George Orthodox Monast Monastery, Der Hal, belonging to the archdiocese of the Orthodox of Mount Athos, uh, Mount Lebanon, sorry, Orthodox Church of Antiochia. Patriarch of Constantinople at Enagoras I, nominate him Archimandrite of Constantinople and later his observer at the Vatican Council uh, from 11 October 1962 till 8 December 1965. His education is astonishing. He made a BA in mathematics and uh, later in philosophy and theology as well. His dissertation was published post-mortem, Apophatic Anthropology. He made a PhD under um, uh, TRV Murti in, uh, on the ultimate its methodological and epistemological connotation according to the Advaita Vedanta, unpublished. He was good friend with uh, Father uh, Raimond Panikar. They met uh, in India and uh, I, truly believe that Father Panikar introduced him to the, um, uh, Enrico Castelli, which was um, uh, a philosopher whom he made epistemologist, but he was busy with the philosophy of religions. And then uh, Scrima was invited to, and Panikar as well to the, Cast the famous Castelli's uh, seminary in Rome. And many uh, of acts were published, and uh, they're uh, a wonderful uh, reference to understand that part of uh, uh, Four Momentis of Andrei Scrima. And um, the president of India uh, visited Bucharest in early 1950s. And while in the Orthodox Patriarchal Palace, he met Father Skrima, who uh, impressed him with his knowledge you know, of Sanskrit and his recitation from the Kata Upanishad. This is a sort of, uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's truly like that, but it seems that it was like that. Many people uh, uh, confirm, uh, confirm this uh, anecdota. He was happy to offer him a scholarship in India uh, shortly before leaving uh, for India. Skima went to Chateau de Beauce, uh, the interconfessional inter ecumenical center near Geneva, set up by the World Council of Churches, where he met Christophe Dumont, director of the Dominican Ecumenical Center Istina and editor for journal Istina in Paris, and later Marie Dominique Chenou and Louis Bouillet, leading names of the Catholic intellectual delight. Andres Crima was on, on one of the most influential Orthodox monks at the time on the Second Vatican Council, not only participating uh, as a personal observer uh, of the Ecumenical Patriarch, but also as the person who created the direct link between the Pope Paul VI and Patriarch Athenagoras I at the most important event of 20th century for the Catholic world. In addition, Scrima introduced by Belgian Cardinal Leon Joseph Suenens was one of the contributors to the commentaries of the council documents, Lumen Gentium, Gaudium et Spes, Dei Verbum, alongside theologians such as Henri de Lubac, Jean Danielou, Yves Congar, Gerard Philippe, Roger Schulz, Carana. Finally, he was, he was present at the meetings of Pope Paul VI uh, with the Patriarch Athenagoras in the Holy Land in Jerusalem on 6, to, 6 January 1964. 
and Constantinople in 25 July 1967. And finally in Rome in uh, October 1967. This uh, position further enabled Scrima to be highly respected as he was immediately welcomed uh, um, as a thinker who united the two churches. Um, Scrima will reside in, uh, re uh, reside in Lebanon between uh, Derhard and Beirut from 1969. And beginning 1970, will become a lecturer at the uh, San Joseph University, Beirut, and uh, the Maronite University of the Holy Spirit Catholic. When he returned to Romania in 1991, he had to give up his academic duties and also had to leave the monastic community of the Antioch Orthodox St. George Monastery. Uh, there, the monks are the custodians of another part of Scrima's archive, as I mentioned before, as well as the publisher of his various texts with a strong theological and monastic. I have been to the monastery twice and have permanent contact with the community and uh, and the Orthodox archaeologists, archaeologists of Mount Lebanon, archaeologists of Mount Lebanon. In various articles, I have also made an introduction to the more mystical side of the community, which is strongly animated by the Jesus prayer, acquired through the careful super supervision of Father Andres Scrima. His biography, like uh, all the others, is much richer in content, but I will must, uh, I have to limit myself. Uh, and I put here only one, uh, what I consider useful here. Then uh, I will, um, well, these are the four professor, professors, but there is um, a patron. Uh, I mean, uh, the person who offered the money uh, to the Institute for Dominique de Menilch Lamberger. Uh, she was born in 98 and uh, passed away in 1997. Her full name is Dominique Iseline Zelia Henriette Clarisse Schlamberger. And she was the daughter of very famous Alsatian Calvinist inventor, Conrad Slamberger, together with his brother, Marcel, both educated at the School of Engineering in France. Conrad invented the system of electrical measurement of mineral exploration known as Schlamberger Array. Years later, uh, they founded the Schlamberger Well Surviving Corporation based in Houston, Texas. Dominique Schlamberger studies studied physics and mathematics uh, at the Sorbonne and had an interest in film and technology. Um, um, well, even Scrima <laughs> was a, the one who um, graduated mathematics and uh, he knows very well, knew very well physics. And um, I think it was uh, um, a part of theology, mathematics and physics and uh, their minds, they, their four momentos were very fit. Very, they were synchronized in some, some way. She converted to Catholicism in 1932, as soon as she married uh, the uh, banker Jean, Jean de Menil. At the time of World War II, she moved to New York, then to Houston, Texas. Jean de Menil became the president of Schlumberger overseas, Middle East and Far East and Schlumberger Surenko, Latin America, both linked with the, with the multinational company Schlumberger Limited. Um, in, until now, they are uh, to the NASDAQ and <laughs> they are famous uh, even today. Um, together with um, well, uh, uh, Dominique becomes a widow in 1973, but uh, together with Jean, however, they founded uh, the, the Menil uh, Foundation, famous for a large number of paintings, sculptures, religious art, sketches, photographs, photographs, rare books, etc. Mother of five children, the last of whom is the leader of Sufi Order in New York, Philippa de Menil. In 1971, the, the Manil family founded the Rothko Chapel, where huge paintings by Marco, Mark Rothko are exhibited and 
where um, they mounted also the Byzantine affrescoes that were later returned to Cyprus. In 1986, together with the former US President Jimmy Carter, Dominique founded the Carter Manil Human Rights Foundation, complementing two decades of human rights activism. They were very close, very, very close. I mean, even the people we, no, I mean, Nasha, Nasha Be, the professor Nasha Be confirmed me uh, this, I mean. And um, since the 1960s, John and um, uh, Dominique Dumelin have focused on the civil rights movement and started a courageous research project, the image of the black in Western art in Houston. Also in 1969, they tried to assemble Baron Newman broken obelisk to celebrate the violent death of Martin Luther King Jr. But it was not accepted by Houston politically light and they mounted it in front of the Rotko Chapel. This is to make you understand the insane courage of activists in times of extreme hostility to African-Americans. I mean, even if you think about it, you know. <laughs> You know, I, I became trembling. Even in the Middle East, they have continued to support the rights of Palestinian refugees and uh, have founded the Institute of Islamic Christian Studies for over two decades. Returning to the Carter Menil Foundation, it should be pointed out that they founded the Car Carter Menil Human Rights Prize, also sponsored by the Rodko Chapel, as well as Oscar Romero Award, after the assassination of Catholic Bishop Oscar Arnulfo Romero Gadamej by a hitman commissioned by the government of San Salvador. Dominique visit, uh, visited Lebanon several times and uh, the entire, um, uh, in, both in, in the uh, 1970s and 1980s, being very close to the academic projects of SCRIMA and the entire academic staff of the Institute. Uh, Institute de Islam Chrétien. I had the opportunity to read the epistolary between Dominique Dumenil and Andres Scrima in the Scrima archive uh, at New York College in Bucharest. And I must say that uh, although it is still restricted from publication and sometimes even for consultation, it is a uh, correspondence with many reflections on the situation and conflict in Middle East and as well as theological ones. Between Scrima and Dominique Duminil, this uh, ex theological exchange ideas uh, was truly powerful and very to a very high level. I, I hope that I will get the chance to, to take something from, from this correspondence and to, to communicate uh, to the scientific uh, groups and to the center, who knows. Um, well, now I think it's better to, uh, this is a wonderful uh, picture with uh, Dominique Dumenil and Father Scrima to their heart in the monastery. And uh, I think it was made in the uh, 1980s. And um, and uh, she was she was familiar even with the the monastic community in their heart. She was very commanding, very open minded, and uh, an extraordinary personality. Even she was speaking very little. There are someone to offer a biography, actually a monographic project to the Manil Foundation, a journalist in New York. And I have, I mean, yeah, I think to go um, to the Manila Foundation and to, to get the chance to study our archive, mainly for the, his relationship with Carter and to see exactly if there is a direct link between uh, her activity in, uh, uh, in Middle East and uh, the Camp David uh, Accords. This is a very, interesting point. I know that many people are not agreeing with the with Camp David uh, Accords. And um, I must say that many documents in, in the archive of uh, in Bucharest, of, uh, which belonging to the fund to the Andres Klima collection, are related with the situation in Palestine, in Palestina and uh, 
um, about uh, Jerusalem and all this uh, and all the situation, critical situation in the Middle East. And um, I think it's still a lot of work to do. And first of all, to, to be able to uh, trigger all this documentation and then to complete it uh, and to have a, a general picture seeing the archive in Houston. That would be may, maybe another uh, complementary project to that one that I, I'm working on. And um, it is rather interesting to reconstruct the history of these accords from another point of view, from another kind of uh, primary sources, which are not quite, are not at all political, but uh, all these documents are belonging to the private collection or um, there are also documents from the ecclesiastical world mainly the Catholic world. So this history should, I mean, it, it might be uh, viewed from another point of view. When, uh, well, uh, now I will uh, continue uh, after this parenthesis. When faith animates science, the purpose and method of teaching uh, are the uh, yaik. There are many documents, some of them edited, that explain the purpose and structure of teaching at the Institute. An article uh, um, by Dupre Latour and Nash, uh, Hisham Nashabet, but part of this uh, information I find it uh, under the firm of uh, Andres Scrima and Dupre Latour specified in, uh, in, uh, in his papers, uh, travel paper, tra tra um, uh, Journal de Travel, uh, that uh, Scrima offered him um, 80% of his materials uh, in justifying the existence of the Institute and not only, and so he's a real thinker, but I think he's modest because he has also a philosophical formation and he was also able to reconfigure the epistemology of, of this kind of uh, new discipline. Um, so they, they uh, published uh, in 1989 uh, in Solidarité Orient, uh, it's not so, it's almost inaccessible today. L'Institut d'Etudes Islamiques Chrétiens de Beirut. And both professors point to the fact that in Lebanon there is a long existence of institution and various bodies dedicated to Islamic studies and Oriental studies. Even in the American University of Beirut and San Joseph University, there are institutes that carry out valuable research in the field, but their methodological approach is one uh, often one-sided. On one hand, Islamic studies enjoy Islamologists who treat Islam as an object in the perfect rationalist scientific line. On the other hand, Islam is treated uh, in a fideistic, even fundamentalistic, uh, fundamentalist tone. Even uh, the same uh, for the studies of Christianity often between religion, religion, Swiss and Strath and confession, confessionalism. The, the Institute project promotes a change in the relationship between science and faith, focusing on the fact that uh, religions cannot be studied by emphasizing only those disciplines that aim to understand the religious phenomenon. Faith is driving force behind the study of religions. And without faith, not even religious science will exist. Therefore, teaching should favor, and I quote, an esprit de recherche suivant une méthode déjà éprouvée selon un mode pluridisciplinaire. Il pouvait faciliter chez les professeurs déjà formés à cette méthode par leur formation universitaire, le dépassement de temps fanatiste partisan et la sécurité de l'objectivité devant un auditoire d'étudiants enclin déjà à la critique et appartenant aux deux confessions. I continue to summarize in English their explanation in, the, uh, in this institute. The very faith of the professor is part of uh, his objectivity. The essence of this teaching is therefore the reflection of believers, Christians and Muslims in line with their own religious tradition. 
uh, and based on a deep scientific knowledge and inter inter internally assimilated with a personal commitment. For example, for the past two years, uh, for four research have been applying, they uh, explained in the article, the method of rhetorical analysis to text from uh, the rhetoric, or rhetoric uh, analysis to text from the Old and Testaments for the Christian tradition and Hadith from the Muslim uh, tradition. Another project to gather basic texts relating to Christian Muslim exchanges with particular emphasis on official statements by religious authorities and declaration from conferences or symposia. Uh, it was a sort of uh, a new trigger and analyze of uh, theological language, both Christian and uh, Muslim. Um, another, uh, well, the aim of this project is to clarify the essential attitude of different Muslim and Christian community towards these exchanges and to analyze their components and motivations. Finally, it appeared important to organize sessions or on medical ethics where Muslim and Christian nursing students from the different nursing schools in Beirut to better understanding of the position of their different religious, religious communities on the fundamental problems of human life, illness and death, and on the problems posed in the different fields of medical practice. If no, it is a sort of avant la lettre, uh, the question of uh, euthanasia or another kind of bioethics. You know, they, they in, in the late 80s, in the early 80s started to, to trigger this kind of, this kind of uh, subject, uh, which are belonging now to a very specific discipline which is bioethics. And actually I, uh, I am, I'm going to publish recently an edition, a critical uh, diplomatic edition of the L'Amour Passage au Limite. Uh, uh, it is a, a course that I find in Beirut in the archive uh, of the Jesuits, uh, Residence de Jesuit. Um, and uh, I'm, I, I already delivered an article in introducing the, the matters of this course. And it is amazing because we find actually um, Scrima explained uh, the death from the historical, uh, religious historical point of view, then uh, bioethics, and uh, finally uh, phenomenological point of view, not rather Christian, but anyway, uh, phenomenological point of view. Um, and often in this manuscript, I found manuscripts, uh, uh, manuscript, I found uh, questions which are belonging to bioethics. Richer uh, research topics. Uh, in uh, 1979, 1980, a first line of research addressed the question, does the conscience of faith uh, exercise a critical function on the word uh, order? A second line of research deal with the question of that modernity possess to Christianity and Islam. Subsequently, a topic emerged that was important for highlight the deep structure, structure of the respective tradition. Another theme uh, was another issue was emerged, scripture and form research into the foundation and meaning of spiritual language in Christian and Islamic art. So it is a sort of, um, this course is amazing. It's a sort of uh, semasiological uh, treaty. So it's a sort of uh, uh, dictionary of semantic analysis of theological language and terms. <laughs> so it's amazing. Um, they had really a brilliant mind. Um, in concrete terms, two professors, one Christian and one other Muslim, both academics agreed to compose their courses according to a similar structure. And in front of the same students, they take turns, uh, one listening to another's lecture and intervening when necessary. In this way, the research is done in common and is enriched by the reciprocal contribution of each religious tradition. For each of the two traditions is supported uh, by the testimony of true believers through scientific contents and uh, high academical standards. There is also uh, 
the testimony of a living faith. There, that is important as well. In this line, each of the professor is invited to present his own or her own religion tradition in the language of that tradition in order to oblige the listener of the other faith to a necessary change of scenery, which will then help them to penetrate the religious universe presented to, to them from within. That's interesting. Um, in the comparative history of religions, the danger of a correspondence between religious elements or externally similar rites is often noted a claim schema. Such com comparison may be useful on one level, but they cannot be star a starting point for understanding a certain religion. They can only provide a superficial synthesis, uh, they claim schema mainly. In order to grasp the original meaning of a religion, one needs to get a glimpse of a religion. It is necessary to grasp the nucleus, the core, the very heart, which gives its constituents elements, their articulation and their deep hierarchy. Now this core, this principle of both unification and creativity is that emerging truth where the revelation stands and which guarantees and criticizes the external form formulation. Although a con convergence may appear uh, between the views and conceptions of God and in the world corresponding to the two, re two religions at the base, it is the difference which is more particularly perceived and underlined. This difference cannot be reduced, otherwise we will end up with a syncretism that will deny the originality and specificity of religion. On the contrary, it must, it must, it must be maintained for the sake of truth and uh, the preservation of authenticity. And it is from this difference that a real and authentic collaboration can be built. What actually, actually uh, present over the origin of the Institute at the time of the constituents meetings. I have taken the liberty of leaving the voice of the founders who have been very careful to specify their purpose with the Institute, their methodological approach and their epistemological choices. Of course, uh, this opened up the question of historical comparative approach in history of religion or religious studies. We know that the great historian of religions, um, mainly Raffaele Patazzoni, you know, has reflected with great care the epistemic area of the discipline. However, religions are considered as object of study completely devoid of their substance, namely the faith. The religious text, the artifact, or any historical element that connects and is related to religions or the religious phenomenon are completely considered by virtue of their historical and uh, historiographical context. Understanding this religious phenomenon could be something more think the professor who uh, reject the confessional approach in the study of true religion, uh, as well as Fides, that is the blind attitude in trust, of trusting in the truth of religious uh, doctrine. Explaining and understanding religion automatically involves reason, but faith is the essence, the core of internal epistemic elaboration, which cannot be denied to the believer either. That's the crucial point, actually. I don't know if the historian of, historians of religions and uh, actually part of my work because I'm doing history of religion as, religion as, as well, is ready to accept it. But how you can uh, teach uh, um, the monotheistic uh, religions or the, the two, uh, religion in comparative ways without uh, in Lebanon or in, uh, in a Middle East context without considering the faith. And I think it's very, I mean, it's very useful to, to reflect on this kind of interrogation. I have another point. Uh, I don't know uh, if I have another time to... Um, yes, maybe five more minutes. So, hmm? Oh, five, okay. So I have some testimonials. Uh, what do we find outside the classroom? I said, and I have some testimonials and uh, well, um, I try to to have some uh, some voices. I mean, I uh, I took from the from the correspondence some uh, témoignages uh, explaining actually what what they the perception uh, their perception uh, in considering the world. 
and uh, I try to translate from French into English. And um, for example, in 40, 24 uh, June 1978, Augustin du Prelatur communicated to Father Scrima, Malheureusement, it is difficult to pass in the zone west because of the uh, terror sporadic and brusquement block the passage. Um, and another one, which is rather powerful, I guess. Um, vous devrez suivre de près la situation libanaise. Uh, un moment. Uh, nous avons eu ces derniers temps uh, d'après-midi et de nuit agitées. Il est vraiment impensable dans l'état actuel des choses de songer, de reprendre la vie universitaire dans notre quartier. Pour ce qui concerne, uh, concerne l'Institut d'études islamo-chrétiens, il faudra sans doute penser à un local à Beyrouth Ouest. Tout en regrettant alors euh, la part de notre auditoire d'infirmerie, mais les professeurs musulmans ne viendront jamais à Beyrouth Est. Nous y gagnerons peut-être les étudiants de uh, American University in Beyrouth. En tout cas, vendredi prochain, nous faisons passer leur examen à nos étudiants de l'école d'infirmerie euh, dans le bureau de Nashabet. And the last one, I you have actually the, the, uh, the English translation is not, I mean, it's not needed to repeat it. And uh, I will pass to the one interesting uh, frame and témoignage. Uh, one uh, on uh, um, divan partout un découragement profond à l'est comme à l'ouest. Car tout, issue, car tout issue semble absent, euh, Laub a pu terminer ses cours et ses étudiants sont maintenant en période d'examen. Mais Nachabé m'a voué son énervement de trouver sur tous les arts du campus des portraits de Khomeini. Il m'a voué l'autre jour avec tristesse car je tâche de traverser Barbie de temps en temps pour le raconter, que j'étais maintenant le seul chrétien avec lequel il demeurait en contact. Il avait de renoncer avec Ibiche en table en Antelia au cause de la difficulté de l'insécurité de faire un passage à Paris. Uh, can you show the, the picture because um, for, for the translation for those who... Uh, yes, uh, of course. Uh, sorry. Yes, sorry. Uh, it is now... Um, we, 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 yeah. It's okay, uh, so, yeah, so that people can read. Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it actually is much easier to, 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 to read it, yeah. Uh, well, I believe that uh, the testimonies are convincing enough to give an, us an idea of the hostile atmosphere in the, um, of the EEA members, the institute members, to their permanent traveling status for more than two decades. Instead, I would like to talk about other documents I have found in the archive, especially the Scrima's found, Scrima uh, collection at the New York College that concerned Jerusalem. I have little time for that, but I will do it. Skrima had collected these documents for which he had also prepared response in his turn. One of these documents is entitled Christian Support Unified Jerusalem Prepared by Interreligious Affairs Department of the American Jewish Community uh, with an introduction by Rabbi Mark Tannenbaum, a rabbi, uh, American rabbi uh, from Belmore, an activist, for, for human rights and social justice. He too was involved in the drafting of various council documents um, from Vatican, including Nost Letate. Returning to the aforementioned mentioned document, it is a miscellany from the uh, 1970s in which various uh, prestigious Christian theologians for all the denominations, evangelical, Roman Catholic, Protestant, ecumenical, and interreligious groups, Reflection from Catholic leaders in the international and local press comment on the issue of the internationalization of the holy city Jerusalem, which actually is very actual even today. The background to the whole issue was the so-called Judaization de, de Jerusalem, Judaization of Jerusalem, which obviously it was very offensive and the reunification of Jerusalem under a single jurisdiction, that of Israelis, recognizes the legitimacy of the rights uh, of the Arab population. On the other hand, the Muslim position was to return in East Jerusalem to Muslim control, 
which was established in 1948 in the wake of Jordanian military occupation of the Holy City in violation of the 1970, 47-year partition plan, their point of view. Rabbi Tannenbaum was disturbed, and I called the recent UN Security Council debate undoubtedly uh, has, re has reinforced that impression, especially since the Jordanian representative seated a uh, quote or uh, a whole range of Christian spokesmen from Pope Paul VI to the National Council of Churches as being uniformly identified with the Muslim position. So that what is to say is that uh, at that time, uh, the question of uh, the status of Jerusalem was under the observation of uh, uh, and the entire world and the, the Christian people, most of them were, belonging to the Muslim position and the Muslim position to the Christian one. Uh, and only the evangelical, the you know, Protestants uh, were actually prepared to recognize the, the new status of Jerusalem under the Israeli um, uh, control. On the one hand, uh, there are the evangelical Christian, as I said, uh, which are in perfect agreement with the Israeli position. And on another hand, the rest of the Christian world, the Vatican, World Council, Western Orthodox, and the Muslim allied. But who are the Christians that Tannenbaum refers to as being aligned with the Israeli position? Um, well, um, he said that evangelical Christians have understood, have understood that. In the past, the restoration of the Jewish people to Jerusalem represented the fulfillment of biblical prophecies. Uh, likewise, theologians such as Karl Rahner, at that time one of the most authoritative uh, voices in the Catholic world states, I cannot see the return of Jerusalem to Israel constitutes a real theological problem for a Christian such that reason of faith will compel him to oppose to return, the return. Of course, I cannot recall all the voices in the document, but hundreds of pages confirm the fact that the question of the status of Jerusalem, it is at the heart of the entire Christian world in the Middle uh, East and beyond, gener generating a kind of solidarity with the Muslim position, especially the moderate Sunni ones. I limit myself only to the documents I consulted and no further. My decision to propose as a hypothesis to become contemplated uh, the link between the four professors of the Institute and their activities beyond the university classrooms. These activities relating to the major problems in the Middle East, such as the status of Palestinian uh, refugees, the status of Jerusalem, the efforts for peace, which then ended up with the Camp David Accord seems to be, uh, seems to me realistic. As I wrote into my abstract, there is not a direct causal link between these political entities, but rather a think tank of Islamic Christian theological relation where peace in the Middle East and the stability of the Palestinian community in the Lebanese context and beyond enucleates a basis for a light discussion of both communities. The main purpose of the Institute's activity was primarily to build the theoretical basis for mutual respect between the two religious communities, given the massacres of infamous fight between the various Lebanese factions. Secondly, it was a question of forming an intellectual lie that at least in Islamic Christian relation will be able to explain the theological basis of two of the two religious identities without slipping into the apologetic approach of any religion. Thank you very much. I. I think uh, Thank you, I will stop could, here. Yes, if you could just unshare, just uh, get us back into the pictures. So, if, you to, if you click on the top, or maybe I can do that. Or you yeah. can give it up. No, it's better if we see each other. <laughs> yeah. That, that one? I could, I, mean... I, I could do it, yes. So, <laughs> I, forgot, I forgot. Yes. So. Thank you very much. I, I before I open uh, the floor to the discussion, this is um, what um, I would describe to my students as an example of um, a micro history, because it, it describes the close knit community that existed between thinkers and uh, religious practitioners uh, who operated under very difficult situation in in a very difficult situation. Yes. Um, namely, not, not just of um, actual warfare, 
but of a situation which did not allow uh, different sides to communicate with each other for uh, reasons of security, such as the snipers who you mentioned. Um, it was very unsafe to go into the uh, uh, Muslim part, for example, yes. uh, or, or vice versa. Um, and um, importantly, it is also a, a world which still continues to exist because of the tensions that uh, the um, unresolved Palestinian question ha has uh, brings along and the unresolved Lebanese situation, because th this is, we, we have, um, we don't have the space to uh, include the current situation in Lebanon, but I know from friends that this is a, um, a very, um, it's, it creates difficulties at various levels which in one way or another, go back to the uh, time of the civil war. Right. Um, that, that's a very simplified version. Uh, I found it very interesting, that's the last thing that I'll say, um, that you're making a difference between religion and faith. And uh, um, th that is um, perhaps a key to, uh, to unlocking the uh, stalemate that we have because faith itself does not create communities. It's a religion that creates communities. And right. once these communities are in conflict with each other, then, then um, it is very difficult to resolve it. But at this point, I would like to invite uh, the others in the room to, to, to come up with questions. Who would like to ask? Yeah, maybe I can uh, I can I can tell to the people that uh, when I was in Beirut the last time, uh, I mean I felt I was um, I ended up in in Beirut after two days uh, when the the Shia community started to protest uh, against the the judge I mean the the person who was judging the the case of the deflagration in 2020. <laughs> And uh, when I arrived in uh, in uh, at the airport, I was um, I mean people stopped me. I mean uh, you know the Hezbollah uh, controlled uh, the airport. That is uh, the reality. And uh, they were amazed that someone is coming to <laughs> to to see Lebanon and at, I mean in Beirut and to to make research in a way. And I was a woman. I mean, I don't felt afraid and threatened at all, but they put me in the office for more than 20 minutes uh, until they uh, get the time to verify everything. And then I, uh, I was uh, obviously free to go. And uh, um, when I took the car uh, and uh, when I arrived to the residence de Jesuit, there are many uh, rumors. Uh, um, it was a sort of um, talk of uh, the Irani uh, spiritual leader, and uh, people were shooting in on the air, <laughs> and I was uh, rather shocked because uh, I no nobody told me that this is a custom. This is. is <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, of course, uh, it was a bit like that, you know, uh, um, with some uh, emotion, some, you know, it's always like that, an adventure. But um, then I started to, to, to speak to the people in the university with the Christians once and, and, uh, and in the San Joseph University, many uh, Muslim are coming and I was participating to a Sufi concert, which was amazing. They are in a wonderful relationship. I mean, they cultivate actually this relationship until today. And uh, the young people are so natural in that uh, Catholic environment. They don't, uh, <laughs> they are simply natural. I don't know. So I don't know. Um, the conflict, it's maybe the reason of the con conflict, it's, it's staying in another part, not, not quite in the religious part. 
but um, what it's um, what it is important is that this education system. Uh, by the way, I make a parenthesis in Lebanon, in Beirut, there are only 50 uh, universities, obviously confessional, non-confessional, scientific, uh, and uh, many denominations are their own university and so on and so on. So that means that people are instructed. Many people are, are speaking uh, five of eight languages, uh, very normal. A normal day for them is natural. So in the university, in San Joseph University, where um, is actually a, a famous department of religious studies as well, where belonging first as a department of the, this institute, actually, uh, because it was the first of the department of to uh, Islamo Christian, and after it, it became an institute. Uh, they are. Uh, they have a, a huge library with uh, Arabic uh, fundamental texts, sacred texts, and uh, a lot of um, um, hundreds of books and uh, documents and so on, so on. And they are very rigorous. I mean, uh, uh, the students, um, by the way, both Christians and Muslims are um, accepted. And uh, it is a wonderful place to be. Uh, only, that, well, in this period, the professors are a bit scared, but because they are not, they are not paid by the, the state, and they have to accept the situation that they can't take from the uh, the bank. Um, uh, rather than a certain ten percent of their own normal salaries. And uh, I think that spirit of revolution, which I felt it in February 2020, rather disappeared in 2020, in 2022. And uh, people are not so, I mean, not so optimistic. Well, Alison, Alison. Yes, uh, Alison has her hand up, yes. She's the one to have courage to put me a, a question. <laughs> Uh, um, thank you so much. I, I've kind of read a little bit of the, the writings of Andre Skrima, but I, oh, I don't, you know, you're, you're talking about him as set him much more into context. I kind of read him as this kind of, I don't know, almost like uh, eccentric who did all these amazing things, you know, that, um, but I, it's fascinating to hear more and, and particularly about his archive and everything. Um, yes. I'm just uh, particularly interested also in uh, Metropolitan Georges Choder in yes. London. And, and I'm wondering, was he part of this um, yes. initiative at all? Or was he friends with these people? I mean, were there links between absolutely. them? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. He was. Uh... I mean, I visit, uh, visited uh, uh, Sua Eminenza. <laughs> I visited him uh, to the uh, metropolitan uh, uh, place, and uh, he was rather old, and uh, maybe a, a little bit annoyed by the people. But uh, when I was speaking about the Scrima, he clearly, I mean, briefly said to me, he was a saint and a genius. <laughs> well, it, it was, I caught the, uh, uh, I called him. Uh, well, he was very active, actually, uh, and he was very critical. In, I mean, if you see, uh, his language is terrible in respect of uh, many situations, considering the um, Israeli uh, part of the <laughs> uh, of these um, uh, negotiations in in the civil war. And uh, he was the founder of the Le Mouvement des Jeunes Orthodox. Mm. Uh, and I've met a, a lot of people who were belonging to this, uh, to this movement. Oh, oh, of course, I, I've met uh, plenty of, yes. Yes, yes, sorry. Sorry, I was wondering, I mean, did members of this movement study at the institute uh, that you've discussed, the, the Islamic Christian Institute? Did, did uh, that, this is a very good question. I think they prefer to have Father Skrima rather as, as a sort of a spiritual leader, and they expect it from Father Skrima to teach them the Jesus prayer. And to, to they were mainly directed by this, the mystical part of the orthodoxy. And because Father Skrima was, um, 
uh, ordained uh, priest in uh, in that archaeodiocese, actually, in uh, in their heart. He became a priest in their heart, and then he received uh, uh, the role of his spiritual father. And then start, and he he was member of a famous group in Bucharest in forties, uh, the uh, Mouvement de Buisson Ardent, um, the Burning Bush Movement. And he was um, a person who has the uh, incessant Jesus prayer. Uh, he was, I mean, he, they accepted him to teach this prayer because he, he, um, he gained it uh, in a uh, permanent way. I mean, he was truly spiritual. So, um, and there is a, another father who, um, also uh, he was invited by the Le, Le Mouvement de, de Jeune Orthodox, uh, Father Gilles. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not remembering. Exactly. Lev, Lev Gilet? Lev Gilet, oui. Lev Gilet. Uh, and also, he also was a pillar of the movement. And uh, for example, I was uh, amazed that one of the members uh, which spoke with me for hours in Beirut, she said that we didn't have not even the liturgical books in Arabic. So the community started to translate, first of all, the homiletic homilies of Father Skrima and then some texts um, and uh, to try to the typicon and so on, so on and try to uh, this lady started to translate something uh, connected to the iconography and so on, so on. So they were very um, poor in, in, in uh, Arabic uh, language, liturgical text and so on, so on. And they ex expected from, from Skrima and from the fathers a sort of um, living tradition, living God, not not a theoretical God, uh, but a living God. And that, that was manifested through the Jesus prayer. And they were very happy to, and by the way, many Catholics started to ask to Father Scrima as well, to join uh, Dominican communities, for example, um, um, male and female, uh, to, to teach them uh, the, the Jesus prayer. And he, he was very um, uh, happy to, to share it. It was a very discreet work. Even his writings, sometimes he published in Istina without his name. He simply affirmed uh, as uh, 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 an unorthodox uh, because he was uh, um, um, the Securitate from the Romanian security was uh, trying to, <laughs> to follow him uh, through very uh, through various personages. I don't want to enter into this uh, this debate this uh, subject because it's uh, very complex and uh, we have um, more time. We need more time to explain. But in the 60s, he was uh, terribly, I mean, the, the Securitate claimed that he was the most important and influent monk to, to be followed and to, to try to convince him to become a, 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 a metropolitan for the diaspora in order to, to have it in, in their own hands. And uh, he was afraid to speak with the Romanian priests. I mean, you know, and... Uh, but I think he, that's why he, met, um, he tried to do his work in a very discreet way, not secret, but discreet. It's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. and by the way, Christian is uh, acting like that. A mystic is acting like that in silence, doing things, not commenting on things. I mean, he was delivering a lot of papers, a lot of when he was asked for, but in a discreet way, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, what is the attitude today in Romania towards Skrima and are his views on Islamic Christian relations, are they part uh, of kind yes. of the, I don't know, what the average Romanian Orthodox today would uh, Hopefully, do, uh, in Romania. help them to kind of view Muslims in a more positive way? Or? 
Uh, that's a very, very, very good question. You know why? Because uh, in one hand, uh, they try to recover the, uh, the monastic phase of uh, scream. I mean, the monastic uh, activity and uh, marriage and what you want. But from, uh, they didn't, I mean, they are, um, it's difficult for them to understand Christianity uh, belonging to the Muslims. I mean, uh, uh, the community, you know, the, the existence uh, between these two, uh, two communities, the reality of Christianity. There is another culture of Orthodox faith in Europe. That's why um, I'm afraid many uh, conservators today are uh, against, and mainly they are religious people, I mean, and they are against Muslim communities. and. Uh, they didn't want to, to be, be very open to this kind of approach of other screamer. And I think in a very humble way, I try to explain why it's so important. If we, someone wants to understand it, it's needed just to go once in, in Beirut, they will understand immediately. I mean, it's, it's a sort of, uh, of immediate uh, perception. It's, it's, uh, you can't stay in Middle in the Middle East without this, uh, this connection with the uh, with the Muslim community, community and with Muslim allies, and by the way, he tried to wrote a lot um, and uh, even giving the theological reason not to reject people and to pay uh, respect for them and for their own identity. And uh, well, actually, I. Um, I have this, uh, it is um, a sort of miracle that I was accepted with this uh, research uh, issue in, in, you know, in the uh, Romanian uh, uh, institutions. We are uh, giving uh, by competition, giving to me this grant. And uh, we, we try to communicate all the time. I mean, uh, in the last year, I didn't uh, do so much communication. I didn't, um, I refuse actually to, to deliver uh, talks or to, to deliver many papers because I still uh, want to, to write and to try to put online the, the writings and the courses from Lebanon in original, in French. A part of this work was done, uh, actually it was translated in Romanian without an edi critical edition, but still there is something. But the language, the theological language of Father Scrima and the this uh, kind of semasiology, where well, the repository of semantic um, connotation of various uh, concepts, Christian concepts, is, is still uh, very, very uh, difficult to accept because simply people prefer to stay in the wood language of Christianity. It, there is a wood language. Uh, um, and I don't want to criticize, obviously. But uh, Father Schema uh, has um, his own approach, speaking often about the hermeneutical, uh, put the hermeneutical uh, um, interpretation of, uh, of Christian texts in act. So that means living tradition, not only quoting tradition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think he was rather clear, but it's difficult to, to be at that level existentially and uh, even even with our mind maybe because not I mean if you are not open with your heart you are not open you are will you will not be open with your mind uh, either so uh, but this is the point that uh, this is my <laughs> my duty to try not only me but my team was a research team. And uh, by the way, brilliant people, Bogdan Tataru Kazaban, for example, which he was an ambassador to the Holy See and he published also uh, a, a journal uh, dedicated to his uh, days in uh, uh, Scrima's uh, activity in uh, the Second uh, Council, uh, Vatican II. And then uh, slightly, slightly they, they uh, because of this project that it is a, a sort of provocative because they said, what, what, what means resilience in, in Lebanon? I mean, what do you mean about that? And I said, look, even being Christian, a practical Christian and being, being uh, uh, with a good preparation and a good, with a spiritual language prepared to accept the other, that it's enough to manifest a sort of resilience and to continue to exist in that space. 
That's the point. Thank you. I'm aware that we should not really go beyond uh, uh, the half past mark. So uh, are there any other questions? It's, um, I, I would like to continue this conversation. Um, yes, uh, but time is uh, rushing. Much further, yes. But uh, further. Um, that, that's the, the reason to have another talk, maybe. <laughs> yes, there will be. Yeah. I mean, it reminded me, for example, also of uh, the situation in uh, uh, Alexandria, uh, Iskandereya in, in Egypt, where you have um, very strong uh, Sufi tradition and, uh, yes. and, and of course, uh, Coptic Christian and all, all Islamic traditions as well, uh, and Jewish community. So it's, uh, it, it's uh, yes. uh, b b you need uh, these, uh, it's not just a social glue, it's, it's a kind of uh, um, freedom of uh, thinking, which um, communities, small communities, who encourage uh, intercommunal uh, contacts create, and and this is important in a city like Beirut. I I, I would um, I could have asked you more about the historical background of the yes. uh, civil war period, but for that we don't have time right now. Uh, that that would have been very interesting because um, the contacts. On both sides of the, the the green line, for example, they were difficult, but they did exist, and um, mm -hmm. uh, th that was a challenge which um, uh, many of the uh, religious leaders also took on them. Well, anyway, yes, if, actually, I would be more than willing to receive another questions, even by email. By email, and, I was uh, going to say, if if there are any further questions. Yeah. Um, I I can circulate your your email address and then yes. uh, we can we can continue this and uh, of course there will be more sessions. Um, the next one will be a round table, so you will get an invitation for this um, in you. the evening. Um, if you're in London, any one of you is in London, then uh, the, the, it'll be also in person. But uh, we will uh, put it on the screen and then you will recognize some of the. Um, uh, members here <laughs> who are present uh, today. Uh, I would be more than honored to, to yeah, come to London yeah. to know to know in person the, the people there. Amazing people, yeah. An amazing initiative, I guess. I mean, that's true and unique. If I if I'm say. Uh, uh, well, well, it's, uh, it's not. It should be more. Um, <laughs> it should be more. We do a little bit. Yes. Anyway. If there are no uh, urgent questions, then I think I would like to stop the recording here. And yes, thank you, thank you, Lars.